and good evening to another installment of Word Up, Living by Faith. So we're putting in, if you weren't with us last week, this is a second installment on something a lot of believers think is in, uh, I guess they would say foundational or something they already know. Uh, but I'm trying to tell you right now that one of the greatest gifts that God has given us, and somebody looking at me now, you need this teaching. I don't know if you want to call it, somebody giving me a, a you know, refresher course, but you need to understand that in the dispensation we're living in and how we're living now, listen to me, sit up and hear this, you will not make it if you don't live by faith. Now, I want to have a word of prayer, and I'm going to pick up, and I want you to let someone else know we're going to be talking about how you turn your faith on, how you use your faith to handle any situation that you go through. God has given us a divine power that cannot be stopped by anything else, all right? I'm just giving you a lead in. Don't you miss this? And somebody said, well, I already know about faith. No, you don't. Not if you're not using it. So let's talk about it. Come on, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for everything that you've done to this point. We thank you right now, God, that you brought us to this time of study in your word. We know that there's four ways your word gets into our lives, through our eyes, through our ears, through our spirit, and through us making sure that we receive it. So God, we ask everyone that's hearing the word of God that they would receive it in their spirit, that it would impact what they're going through. And right now, God, there will be a supernatural release to somebody sitting in their house as they speak words of faith and understand the words that they're speaking. We pray now, Lord, that whatever's happening, whatever they pray for, is going to come to pass. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we started off by telling you that a lot of times people think, I need more faith. You don't need more faith. You need to learn how to grow and use the faith you have. You have all the faith you need. We talked with Romans 12 and 3. For I say unto you, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. You have a measure of faith that you need to grow. The measure is in you. That means whatever you're facing, God has already placed enough divine power in you to handle it. Somebody say, I can handle it. Now, if you understand that, then that means I have to activate or use the faith that I have. And I used an analogy last week talking about our brain when people say, you know, I only use 10% of my brain power. No, we use all of our brain, but we have not gone to the habit of understanding and releasing that which we're using. All of our brain is being used, but you're using all the faith you have based on where you are. Does that make sense? You're using all the faith you have based on where you are. God has given you a measure of faith. But just because you're only using a little faith doesn't mean you don't have enough faith. It means you need to invest in learning how, watch the word, to live by faith. Every moment of your life has got to be lived by faith. From the little decisions to the big, I had to learn this. Because we're, we're crippled by so many other crutches, by so many other things, by so many other belief systems in our own life that... We put God somewhere where he is not the priority. And then when a big problem comes, we try to, you know, grunt and stand by faith. That's a problem. You have to understand that I have the measure and then you use it like you have the measure. What am I talking about? If I'm going to pay a bill and I know I have money in the bank, when I sit down to pay that bill or I walk into a store to pay a bill or walk into a place to buy something and I know I have enough money, I don't sit there and think, can I afford this? I don't sit there and think, am I going to be able to do this? I know the amount of money I have is enough to cover the purchase. Well, I'm talking to you, my brother and sister, the amount of faith you have, this is how exact God is. This is how sovereign God is. You have enough faith to handle what you're going through, but you have to use it. 
It does no good to have faith and not use it. So if you don't use your faith, you can't say, I don't have enough faith. No, you're just not using all the faith that you have. The Bible says again, Paul said, there's given to man the measure. What does the measure mean? It means that God in his sovereignty looked out. He knows your life. He knows all things. And God said, uh, in 2018, my servant is going to have to fight against an eviction from their house. Their money is going to be challenged. Their, their finances are going to be challenged. So I got to give them faith to go through that ordeal while I'm making a way for them to get through it. Do you realize that that's the most important part is to realize I have it. So I'm not worried about it, but I just got to use my faith while God is working it out. So God said, I'm going to give you the measure, but you have to use it. Did you get that? So what happens is no matter what you're doing, you can be ex exasperated. You can be exhausted. You can say, I don't know what's going on. Why is God letting me go through this? Change your attitude now and remember you have enough faith to get through this. Come on, somebody say that with me. See, the devil tries to rob your mind. He tries to rob you of the ability of knowing who you are in God and making you think that you don't have the resources that you have to fight the problem you're going through. But you don't have to worry because God said, I've given you the measure of faith to handle cancer, to handle lack to handle your mental situation, to handle the problem your children are in, to handle your financial. God said, I've given you the measure, but you have to live by it. And you can't live by it only when you're in desperation. You can't live by it when you think, I'm just going to come together and now it's going to work. When I do funerals, I have a lot of people, when I'm preaching the funeral, and I'm preaching, unfortunately or fortunately for some folks, I believe that a funeral is a time to eulogize, but also to tell someone about the saving grace of God because they're staring in the face of their mortality and they realize, hey, I'm going to have a time when that's going to happen to me. Am I right? At that moment, you have a picture into their heart and they can see that with all of my bragging and boasting, as a man, I can't handle this thing called death. I better be ready. But when I do those funerals, I make sure everyone understands that you have to be prepared for what you're going through. You can't wait till time to die and believe you're going to be able to handle it. So I talk about people who believe in deathbed professions, confessions. Oh, I believe that when I'm getting ready to die, I'm going to cry out to the Lord and, and I know he'll save me. My question to you is, how will you know that you're saved? Let me give you a hint, my brother and sister. If right now there's some of us who have been saved a long time, and if we don't purposely, and somebody can co-sign this on the chat, if I don't purposely rehearse the word in my mind and the scriptures and look back in my past and see what God has done, sometimes I've been walking with the Lord these 30 years, and I still struggle if I don't focus, if I don't concentrate, if I don't remember that I have to live by Faith. So God has given you the measure, but you have to use it and live by it. And then we talked about you can be in a position, Matthew 17, 17, there is where God has given you the measure of faith, but then there's a place where you can be where you're faithless. What's interesting is God was talking about a generation that's coming up with no faith in Matthew 17, 17. Listen to the words of the Lord. Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? God is saying, with all the miracles you've seen, with folks' lives you've seen turned around, when you've seen Uncle Johnny who used to drink himself to death, make a confession for Christ, now he's got on, well, not so much a shirt and tie, but now he's got his Bible or his computer where he's got a Bible on his phone and he's in church every Sunday and he's telling everybody else about God. He stopped drinking to excess. He got saved. What am I talking about? That you are faithless because you will not reach out and trust God. And so I don't believe that a believer can be faithless but I preached on Sunday that unbelief is situational. Go back and listen to that message. 
Because what happens is, I may have enough faith to believe God for this situation, and everybody listening to me, don't tune me out, because I bet you, you can go back and see a situation where you stood by faith, and you're saying, wow. And now every bit of anxiety and emotion is swelling up in you about what you're going through now. When you need to go back and grab that understanding and say, if I had faith to go through that, I can handle this. Don't let your faith go through these ebbs and flows. I'm talking about in the morning, set a standard and say, today I'm going to live by faith. Now, it's going to hurt sometimes to live by faith. But you have to, you have to know that I need to exercise my belief as a believer, my belief in God, I need to exercise my faith so that God can do what he needs to do in my life. And then we talk to you about not only uh, the measure of faith and the fact that there can be faithlessness, but we also talked about a great faith. Remember the centurion son when Jesus Christ said, I've never seen so great a faith. And all he was saying is this man was living by faith because the man told Jesus, you don't have to come to my house to heal my servant. I believe, wow, if you speak the word, it will happen. How many know that is powerful? It blew Jesus' mind that someone said, Jesus, just speak the word. I'm telling you because Jesus died, forgave us power, transferred sonship unto us. Somebody catch this then all you have to do is speak the word. You say, Pastor, will my feelings change? No, but speak the word. Will my situation change automatically? No, but speak the word. Why? Because I believe the word has power that Jesus has birthed within that word. Jesus Christ said, my word shall not come back to me, boy. Speak the word, and something's going to happen on the inside of you. I got somebody watching me now. You, you've spoken everything else over your situation, but have you spoken a word? You say, Pastor, but I'm saved, and I got that thought on my mind. Listen to me. Having it on your mind is not the same as speaking it, and there's processes or principles God has sent into motion. He is the one that says you have to speak the word over your situation. Not speak any words, hallelujah, that's your problem. You go to church, you shout, you say, you hear preachers, you see stuff. When it comes time, you may say a little prayer, but God is saying, I want you to saturate your problem with the word of God. If it's healing, throw every healing scripture you have at it. And while you're doing that, there is this metamorphosis, this change that happens inside my spirit. You know, the spirit of man is a candle of the Lord. Something happens in my spirit where I get bold and I just start believing I can go through situations because I've spoken the word over the situation. It's not always that easy. There are other moments when I've been sitting in meetings sitting in crowd, in a crowded situation, and I was fighting a spiritual battle. Warfare was going on in my mind, and I was about to lose it. Can anybody identify? It was something that could have been a life-threatening situation, but I remember sitting there, throwing all of my faith at this problem, and just saying, now, fear. Going all over my body, anxiety. But I'm sitting here saying, but my God promised he would work it out. Whatever the situation was, I put that precursor, my God promised. Then I say a promise. And then the situation or the symptoms come back again. Well, the situation is still in front of me. But I say, my God promised. Because great faith, which, which really is the motion of faith, because to me, all faith is great if you use it. It's just telling God, I believe it because you spoke it. I believe it. 
I believe in Bible study. A lot of Bible study is about making sure you confirm and confess and understand the teaching as it's going forth. That's why a lot of times you'll, have, you'll hear me say, just repeat this to yourself. You're enlightening your own spirit. You can't live naturally and think you can receive the things of God. The Bible tells us the natural man cannot. You can't listen to me with a natural ear. You have to listen to me with a supernatural ear. You have to believe I can live by faith. And the crazy point is, when you're desperate, you jump right into that faith bandwagon and try to say it when God is saying, but if you would just live by it, there would be a steady, slow progression where faith would take over your spirit and you will get stronger and stronger. So God said you must live by faith and you need to understand that if you live by faith, you need to understand what faith does. Matthew 17, 20 says, because you have so little faith, I truly I tell you, which is the next faith we talked about, you can just have a mustard seed. A mustard seed, the Bible tells us, is the smallest seed but when it's planted, it can yield a great fruit. All I'm telling you is, even if all you have is a mustard seed of faith, a small amount of faith, you can, it can hold you up. You can live by it. I know I have a witness that can sit here and say, um, people are under the mistaken impression that people who live by great faith are people who walk around never fearing, always confident. No! When you have great faith, it means you step out on faith even when you don't know what's happening. Real faith is stepping out and trusting because the word says so, because God says so, because I believe God. But if I had a mustard seed, which is the next kind of faith, I'm trying to tell you how to activate your faith. Understand, if I have a mustard seed of faith, I can speak to a mountain and the mountain will remove. This word mountain, as Jesus was speaking it, is symbolic, or it's an analogy, but it's also true. The mountain represents my burden. The mountain is something that is overwhelming. It's unmovable. It looks like a big deal. When Jesus said, speak to the mountain, he knew that your problem was going to be a mountain size, believer. You were not going to have a small problem. You were going to have a mountain size problem. Problems are perspective. It could be a major problem for me based on who I am physically. But also, if I have a mustard seed of faith, it does not make a difference how big my mountain is. My God is able to do it. So you need to understand, to live by faith, all you need is that seed of faith. And the rest, God can carry out. But you can't take your foot off the gas. You can't back up and say... I'm going to live naturally for a while and this makes sense. This is common sense. No, somebody ought to hear this. You got to say as a believer, I need to live by faith. So we got a mustard seed of faith. We talked about great faith, Matthew 8 and 10. And then we talked about in Matthew 9 that the reason you, have, you need to have a mustard seed faith or you need to have faith, right, is because Sometimes the things you're going to through can only come out by prayer and fasting. That's connected. When the disciples said, why couldn't I cast, why couldn't we cast out the demon from the, the father's son? He said to them, because some kind only come out by prayer and fasting. Let me ask you a question. You got a big problem. And I mean a serious problem. I'm not talking about one of these things you can just shout away that there is, a, there is a chance that it could end in death or it could end in something really crazy in your life. But you're standing by faith. You're fasting and praying. What are you doing while you're fasting and praying? Fasting and praying in itself is helping me reach my goal. It is the means by which I get sanctified to reach the goal that I need to reach. But while I'm fasting and praying, the only thing I have to live on is my faith. You can't fast and pray without faith. The enemy won't let you. Your body won't let you. Your flesh won't let you. Again, don't think naturally. Think supernaturally. Anybody who has experience, 
in my lifetime, I have fasted. And I remember some days I was doing something and I, didn't, I wasn't fasting. And I turned around, it was 2 o'clock before I needed something to eat. Before I even thought about something to eat. I was so, my mind was so engaged with something else. But as soon as I turned it to a fast with a purpose, with a desire, with God growing me and moving me and making me stronger. And I said, well, I'm, and I was only supposed to pass a half a day that day. Man, you know yourself. You're looking at the clock. Oh, my God, it's only 10 o'clock. Or you look at the clock again and say, it's quarter after 11. And your mind is on that food until you grow and get more mature in your actions about fasting. And you'll be able to then again preoccupy your mind. But what I'm telling you is that you have to have faith to hold on until it's time to break the fast or you've actually taken the power out of the fast because the whole time your mind was on food. You have to get to the point that you tell yourself, with faith, I can sacrifice. With faith, I can move in obedience. With faith, I can deny myself things. With faith, I can receive things and not let them take my mind off of God. But you have to understand that you must live by faith. Somebody right? Living by faith. That's how I'm living. And when you understand that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, you'll know that I need to put all of this faith power that God has given me in action. Let me give you one more. You need believing faith. Uh, and believing faith is different from saving faith. So let's talk about believing faith first. Go to Matthew 9. Uh, verses 27 to 29. Matthew 9. I'm going to read this. I, I, I'm putting myself in real time with you so we can all find it together. If you find it first, eh, so what? Let's go to Matthew 9. Right? I got it. Verse 27. And Jesus passed by from thence to blind men, followed him, crying out, and saying, Have mercy on us, thou son of David. And when he was coming to the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said unto them, Listen, believe you that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yes, Lord. Then, they touched, then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done unto you. Let's unpack that. Believing faith. He says that it's contingent upon you understanding not a corporate belief, but you have to have an individual belief that you have grown in your relationship and walk with God. These two blind men, were, he came by, and the blind men came to him and wanted to be healed. So they came to him. So even though you came to God, the question in his mind is what he asked the blind men. The question he's asking you, before anything can happen, God is saying, do you believe I'm able to do this? That's a mouthful. If you don't think God is able to do it, you can sit there and say you're walking in faith all you want, but it's not faith until in your heart and mind, you'll know that my God is able to do it, and I will not let my unbelief stop me from getting something that I know God possesses for me. Did you get that? Don't let your unbelief. So you got to talk to yourself constantly. Lord, help my unbelief. Lord, right now, build up my faith. I know you can do it, but I'm just not able to release my faith yet. Go until you can believe it. Believing faith is a prerequisite for our deliverance. Listen to what he said in the rest of this passage. He said, let it be done according to your faith. Not your wife's faith, not your, not your uh, children's faith, not your pastor's faith, not anybody else. You need to walk individually in your faith and let it be done according to your faith. And when belief came in, their eyes were open. So we got believing faith. We got great faith. We got faithlessness. We got mustard seed faith. And now there's another faith, which is, some people say this is the beginning, but it's called saving faith. 
Let's, let's explain this. Ephesians 2 and 8 tells us, but, but, but you were saved by grace, that you were saved by faith and that of grace, not of yourself, but of God, right? Let me get that. Let me, let me, let's go to Ephesians. We say these scriptures all the time, but I want to make sure I'm saying it totally correct. For by grace have you been saved, but look at this, through faith. And that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should glory or boast. But we've been saved by grace, not of ourselves, but the only reason the grace was received was through our faith. Saving faith is the faith that initially saves us. When, when Jesus comes in, it, it, it's the faith that I believe in the middle of a turmoil. Think about something. I was not a believer. It was pre my conversion. But the Spirit of God kept drawing me. That's what the Bible is talking about, God's grace. He saw me doing what I was doing, but he drew me. And then, even if I ran away, he chased me and pursued me. Come on, I know I'm not the only one. And he saw me doing more stuff. And he carried me because I was one of his chosen. I was one of the elect. So I'm sitting in a room with everyone else and we're, you know, smoking blunts. So we're drinking and we're driving down the road and we didn't have an accident when our driver was totally stoned because I was in the car and at his elect, he saved me through that so that one day I could receive this salvation through my faith. The question that's asked when you got saved is you come to a point in your spirit Beyond the natural is when that spirit and your mind comes to a place where it all acquiesces and come to agreement that, wow, I need to be saved, and the only way I can be saved is through Jesus Christ. Once we have that initial experience of saving grace and saving faith, we are saved. That's why the Bible says we got to be the ones when we get saved to speak the word. There it is again. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart, that's your faith. Confess with your mouth is the action of your faith. That's the through faith he's talking about. Now you got saved. Do you realize this part we're getting to? Don't, don't lose me, because here's the most important part. I'm going to need that saving experience to help me throughout my journey because there'll be other moments that I'm going to need to be saved from my flesh, saved from him, not saved by getting salvation, but that faith that was my initial saving is the faith that's going to resurface that makes me say, oh no, I'm a believer. I now have abundant life. I now have the weapons of my warfare. They're not carny, but carnal, but mighty through God. I can pull down strongholds. I now have the whole armor of God. I got a shield of faith. Where did I get all that from? I got it from that initial understanding that I'm saved. And saving faith is what brings me to a place that no matter what I go through, sickness, whatever it is, I tell the story, and it's, it's, it's one of the one of the things that, when I first got saved, I was so sold out on Jesus. I was so trying to catch up with all the time I wasted. And any believer tell you the same story. Wasn't it something? As soon as you got saved, it's like, I'm running to get more. This is so good. My, my soul is hungry. I need more God. There's a world out there of supernatural and unbelievable things that can happen if I just believe. So I'm grabbing and I'm getting this state and I'm getting all this stuff in me. So I remember we were going to buy our house. I went to the appointment, supposed to have money in my briefcase, and all I had was a briefcase full of faith. My wife and I went to the appointment to buy the house. We we're supposed to have our down payment. We did not have it, but we went to the appointment anyway by faith. I'll say it again. I didn't have to drag my wife. Thank God for a good wife. She just thought I was a little crazy, but she went with me, and we sat in front of the man, and the first question he asked me was, do you have the money? Watch this. I said, by faith. He said, okay. All right. We're going through everything, and he said, oh, by the way, 
You don't need your deposit tonight. You can sign the papers, and we won't need that for a few weeks. So, you know, take the money back home. <laughs> what nothing in the briefcase. But we walked out of there, and we watched how God took our faith. What about if we just stayed home? What about if we would have said we're not going? We had never got our first house, but we were trusting God because the Lord had told both of us in our spirit that was our house. I don't know what I would have said if the man would have said, give me the money. I was so crazy, I would have believed that somehow there would have been money in the briefcase. I know that sounds weird. I'm just telling you when you're living by faith, something happens when there is that connection. So saving faith, believing faith, means it helps me believe something I need to have. But saving faith, I'm going to have to rely on my full walk in conjunction with my belief. I'm going to have to rely on the fact that I'm saved. I'm not taking this. No. The greater one lives in me. I'm saved. I'm not going for that. And then there is one more. Well, there's two more. The gift of faith. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 and 11. Let's talk about the gift of faith. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it tells us starting at verse 4, I'm reading from the American Standard Version. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are diversities of manifestations, and the same Lord. And there are diversities of workings, but the same God. Same Spirit, same Lord, same God. You need to follow that. Who worketh all things in all things, in all. But to each one is given of the man of the spirit, a manifestation of the spirit to profit for everyone. For to one is given through the spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge, to according to the same spirit, to another faith in the same spirit. There's a gift of faith that is a given. It accompanies certain offices. But it is a gift where you have supernatural faith beyond your own ability to believe. It's been gifted to you. There's some people that have the gift of faith where they don't wrestle like you do because you notice that that gift was given to them so it could profit the whole body. It profits everybody. So when you see some people standing up and they're the people that are leading the way, you may have a friend in the group. And in that group, they're the person with that gift of faith telling everybody else, this is going to work. When other folks can't see it, they keep speaking it. When other people don't know what's happening, they keep speaking it. Somebody listening to me has that gift of faith. It's like, I'm going to live by faith, and that's it. There is no plan B. There is no other recourse. I don't have any other way to live. I'm going to live. And they speak so confidently that God will do it. And God gives us people scripturally who have that gift of faith. Stephen, when we go to the book of Acts, he had that gift of faith. He didn't care if he was going to get stoned. He knew, and, and there's a song I love um, that it was by a long, long time ago. It's an old Christian song by Andrews and Blackwood that says, heaven is just a stone's throw away. Meaning that if your faith is real, you don't fret and get bent out of shape and give up and retreat and quit when things get really tough that your life may be on the line because you already understood that, as Paul said, if I die, it's gain, right? So even if I die, Stephen knew that when they stoned him, heaven was just that stone's throw away. My life is not all enthralled down here. I'm not captivated only by what I can get on this side. I live in heaven. My, my real life is in heaven. I'm a citizen of heaven once I come into the belief of saving faith in God. So the gift of faith is what keeps the body of faith. Um, when you look at the fivefold gifts, when you look at the teachers and the pastors and preachers, when you look at uh, the apostles and the bishops and those folk who operate in these offices, there's a gift of faith where this person is not given this gift not only for themselves but the strategic way God has placed it in the body is going to profit everyone. And then finally there's the fruit of, space, of faith. This is the one we all 
can take part in. Go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. So if we look and start at verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control, against such there is no law. Faithfulness is a fruit that happens or grows as I walk in faith. I am now considered faithful to God. So the fruit of my faith is faithfulness. And when I have faithfulness, the other nine fruits of my spirit, it grows in my spirit area, I become a faithful person. Now we're talking about when you grow in your faith, when you get to the point that you know your faith is working, it's because the fruit of my labor, I've planted, I've watered, I've nurtured, how? By faith. I planted by faith. When things didn't look good, I kept pouring faith water on it. When it looked like my faith was dying, I nurtured my faith by reading more, by long walks with God and making my mind and bringing my flesh into, you know, under, under my own authority and making my flesh do what I wanted to do. All of that turned into now, here is the fruit that's growing from your acts of faith. You are now walking in faithfulness. And I don't have to tell you, the reward God gives for faithfulness. We were, we were talking, a, a group of us, about where we came from and where we, you want to see something that will motivate your faith? Talk about where you came from and where you are now. Talk about the mountains you've already climbed. And man, we have some mountains in our life that when you look back on them, it's like you shiver like, oh my God, how did I do that? But you did it by faith. Faith, my brothers and sisters, is what you have to live by. So we talked about believing faith, measure of faith, mustard seed faith, saving faith, the gift of faith. We talked about the fruit of faith. We talked about great faith. Because all of this is how you make your faith grow. There's going to be a situation that you will have where you need to use one of these faith. You're going to need to use your faith in one of these capacities. And now we need to go to... Hebrews chapter 11, we're heading there. Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to look at the hall of the heroes of faith and those who walked in faith. Their principles in their lives will show us, and this is what I like about God, he'll show us ordinary people. God uses ordinary people, just like you and me, to do extraordinary things when they do it by faith. So we're going to look at the book of Hebrews, but I want to give you a summary of the book of Hebrews first. So you'll understand when we get to that faith chapter, why it's so important. Um, the book of Hebrews, and I think I started this a little last week just to tell you that we know that the Christians Paul were writing to were under, at that time, heavy, heavy persecution. They were dying. Um, they were hated. And yet, the summary of the book of Hebrews is God was comparing the old covenant that they were under then, looking down prophetically to the new covenant and letting us know in the book of Hebrews that we are now under a better covenant. You really can't, well, you can use your faith, but to have an essential understanding of the covenant value of your faith makes you know that God made the way or paved the way for your faith with blood. It's not something you just can ignore unless you totally, totally allow the enemy to take over your thoughts so you can't see what God has done. But it's the basic understanding of the Old Testament law based against the New Testament that we're walking in. And what God said was, because all those years I had my prophets, um, I had the kings, I had the patriarchs, I had all those people living by faith. They could not convince you or they could not defeat sin. I had to then create a New Testament that was not 
built on laws because the laws could not help us live by them. There's many times when we have said we may build a law, but just knowing the law doesn't mean that you have the ability or the capacity to obey the law. You have to force yourself because our flesh is unruly. Evil in us is unruly. We identify sometimes with the wrong spirits, and those spirits drive us. So God said, essentially, I'm taking this out of your hands. I'm creating a new covenant, a better way of living, and it's all based on my son, Jesus Christ. Let's look quickly, verse by verse, at this. He, I mean, chapter by chapter, not verse. We'll be here all day. I just want to kind of summarize the chapter, and then we'll go to 11, and you'll see. Hebrews 1 is about the supremacy of Christ, Jesus. Um, in Hebrews 1, he paints a picture of how Jesus is more superior than the angels. Because of the redemptive work he did on the cross, he redeemed us. He brought us back to a place what Adam and Eve lost. But Jesus, so Jesus was greater because the law could never bring us back to a total position of obedience. But Jesus said, when, I bring, when God said, when I bring the New Testament in, it's going to be based on truth, on mercy, on grace and truth. Meaning that God said, I know my children now. They are so unruly. I'm going to have to have grace for them to follow. And I'm going to have to give them an opportunity to be sanctified. Jesus represents to us a greater, a more superior covenant. By understanding this, you'll understand that my faith is rock solid because it's built on Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 2, follow me. Hebrews talks about the role of Jesus Christ in salvation. Um, that he's better than the law. Better than the law of Moses. Because I just told you why. But salvation is solely based on his sacrifice and love for us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave Jesus, but Jesus had to want it to be given, right? He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So it's talking about how his death brought a power. Hebrews 2 talks about Jesus conquered death. So that all of us who are alive would no longer have a fear of death. Death cannot hold us. It can't scare me. Once I'm in Christ, I've died to sin. I no longer face that second death. When I leave here, the Bible said to be absent from my body, I walk right. This, this, when you know this, you stand on your faith. You don't let things shake you. You know, it's almost like you get to the point of Esther. If I perish, let me perish. But I'm going to make sure my life is built on faith in God. In Hebrews 3, he actually says Jesus is better than Moses and superior to that covenant. Wow. And when you look through that, it's showing Jesus is greater. Hebrews chapter 4, it talks about Jesus being better than the Old Testament. We talked about the Sabbath day and time of rest. When he's saying, look, I promise you a different kind of rest. You're going to enter now into a spiritual rest, which is a greater rest than you would have gotten from the law. Because Jesus said, Hebrews chapter 5, Jesus is our perfect high priest. Oh, I love this chapter. So, you know the high priest was the one who sacrificed for the people. He made the sacrifices. Jesus is our perfect high priest because he knew we could not make the sacrifice for ourselves. And yet, the Bible said the soul that sinned must die. So Jesus said, I know what, I'll die for you. I'm still talking about what your faith is built on. Jesus said, now, because of what I've done, I'm your perfect high priest. All of your sin debt has been wiped out. Hebrews 6 talks about when you are in the midst of becoming a believer, in the last days, we're here, my belief, you can put that solely on me after all I've seen, there'll be a falling away from the truth, a walking away from the truth, and it's impossible to come back to repentance because it subjects Christ to the same open shame. Here's what it's saying. Don't anybody get in their mind, you can lose your salvation. Please don't let make me go there. I always tell 
the hypocritical, pharisaical, um, superiority believing saints who believe, well, when I ask them, well, why don't you want to lose your salvation, but you believe somebody else want to give it up? The Bible completely secure, assures us that once I'm saved, nothing can pluck me out of his hand. You notice that this falling away, if you read this text, talks about being impossible to come back to repentance. It's talking about a reprobate mind that has never fully received God. If somebody, and all of you out there, we can, we can debate about this later, but tell me when you do. Show me where. Show me how. It's talking about you can never come back and repent again. I've never seen a passage where God said, I will forgive you. This text is going to be a falling away. How we know it's talking about unsaved because it's saying they're going to stay in a place where their mind is reprobate and they will not come back and repent. Understand that. They are damned by their own actions. That has nothing to do with a believer. If God came down and did all he did through Jesus and we could still just walk away from our salvation, what kind of wisdom or strength is that? Forget that argument. Let's look scripturally at what Jesus Christ has said. He paid the price for our sins. And someone tries to point to the scripture, but if you look at it, it actually says, um, if they had been one of us, they would not have walked away from us. It's impossible. But since they were not one of us, they proved that by being, walk, being able to walk away with us. I believe truly, there's a lot of people in church, you shout, you clap, you mimic, that's what the devil does. You, you, you may even speak in tongues, you do all of that. But it doesn't mean you're saved because when we look at the fruit of your life, there's no change in you. The reality is, that if we walk out on that branch that we can't find repentance, some of you pastors need to turn in your collars. Some of you shout saints need to leave church, go out there and just wild out. Because all of us, if you be honest, have found ourselves in a position where we need repentance. So what about if there was a place where God wouldn't accept it? No, a reprobate mind is talking about the unsaved. You need to understand that. The falling away is what this society is doing now. They're falling away from the belief of Jesus Christ. They're believing in their own thoughts. They're believing in what they want. They believe in what they want for sexual identity. They believe in what they want when it comes to marriage. They believe in what they want. And when we start falling away from what God says, don't get mad at the church. I had someone ask me. I said, look, guys, I will never deprive a person from doing what they feel like is going to make them whole, well, and healed. But the bottom line to everything is, at the end of the day, you have to settle that or reconcile that with God. Don't get mad at the messenger. I will never spew hate. I will never tell you that God don't love you. I, I, don't, I don't have that capacity. I will never tell you God can't love an LGBTQ person. That's crazy. God loves all of us in our sin state. But I will tell you there's a position that we have to come to where we all have to reconcile with God that we are living the way he desired and told us in his word because it's not ours to give. The reconciliation comes from the fact that God is going to be the one that says he loves and don't love. And listen to me. No believer has the capacity to sit there and tell you who God won't love. We know God don't love sin, but we also know we can all repent. So I don't believe there's any state that anybody can't come back from and repent. And I believe God is going to be the one who has the final say in that person's life. And I tell somebody another thing. I remember when I had prison ministry, um, and we were going down to the prison. I was at New Baptist Church, and I thank Pastor Goosby. He entrusted me and several of us prison ministry. You can ask some of my colleagues. There were people there who were Muslims that came in. There wasn't too many Sundays when we left there. We gave an altar call. They gave their life to Christ. Now, somebody might say, well, God don't love Muslims. Muslims but look, that's your call. All I'm saying is if they start seeking and desiring God, man, you better be careful who you play with. 
Because if you start playing with God, if you start really saying, Lord, show me who you are, and God gets in your heart, have I got a witness, you will change. There will be a drastic change because you can't look into the eyes of Jesus. I believe this with all my heart. You can't look at the sacrifice. You can't look at the heart of Jesus. You can't believe what Jesus does. You can't feel his embrace and not give your all to him. And then chapter 7, we'll pick up reviewing this next week. Come on, this is going to be exciting. Then we're going to get into Hebrews 11. But right now, what your takeaway is, until we get back, share this with someone. I'm going to live by faith. This Pastor Duncan is saying, God bless you. I'll see you again. Come back to another Word Up Faith broadcast so God can speak to your spirit. Have a great day.